It wasn't a topic of discussion during the just completed election campaign, but it might be one of the new government's first challenges. Asylum seekers crossing into Ontario from the U.S. with the hope of finding a country willing to let them stay. Let's find out more about what's ahead at both the provincial and federal levels from Audrey Macklin. She is professor and chair in human rights law at the University of Toronto. Francisco Rico Martinez, co-director of FCJ Refugee Centre and a past president of the Canadian Council for Refugees. And Craig Damien Smith, associate director, Global Migration Lab at the U of T's Monk School of Global Affairs. And Craig, your first time here. Nice to welcome you. Thanks for Come having me. Along with a couple of veterans here. So just watch them. They know what they're doing here. I want to, Sheldon, let's bring this up first. This is a sign that people trying to cross the border between official border crossings are faced with, and it says, stop. It is illegal to cross the border here or any place other than a port of entry. You will be arrested and detained if you cross here. And despite that warning, in the first five months of this year, if we can look at the stats, here we go, more than 9,000 people have entered Canada outside official ports of entry, 90% of them at the Quebec border, that according to the Canadian press. In April, the federal government began fast-tracking some of those people into Ontario, shelters and services. Craig, we're going to put you to work right away. Why would someone choose to cross a border at that location with that sign staring them in the face, knowing that it could be legal trouble? Uh, the, the Safe Third Country Agreement, I mean, it's, it's put in place because... What is that? Just say what that is. Uh, I think, that, Audrey, you're the expert on the Safe Third Country Agreement. Maybe I'll defer to you and then I can talk about reasons why people move. Good enough. The Safe Third Country Agreement provides that an asylum seeker must make a refugee claim in the first country that she arrives in as between Canada and the United States. So an asylum seeker who enters the United States and arrives at the Canadian border asking for asylum in Canada will be deflected back to the United States and vice versa. It looks like a reciprocal agreement, and in principle it is. But the fact is that the flow of asylum seekers is disproportionately from south to north. Relatively few go from north to south. Mm -hmm. One might ask then, why would the United States ever agree to this? Because, of course, it results in a net increase in the number of asylum seekers. The reason is really that after 9-11, uh, the United States extracted all sorts of border concessions from Canada. Canada had long wanted this agreement so that it could reduce the number of asylum seekers in Canada. Uh, the United States resisted, but after 9-11, the United States decided to, in a sense, throw Canada a bone and sign on to this agreement. So it's been in place since 2004. And having said all that, why, when faced with that sign, do people come anyway? Uh I mean, under the Refugee Convention, it, it's not illegal to enter a country irregularly uh, to claim asylum. That's, that's built into international law and Canadian domestic law, uh, so long as you make an asylum claim uh, immediately or, or as early as possible. The way that I teach students about irregular migration, which is what we, we call this type of movement, um, is that there are push and pull factors. There are reasons that people leave countries of origin or places that they're staying, uh, and a differential that makes them want to claim asylum or reach uh, a country where they see their life chances as being better. Is it technically illegal, Audrey, for someone to cross at one of those points where it says, stop, don't cross? Contrary to that sign, it is not a violation of Canadian immigration law to enter Canada between designated ports of entry. It is lawful as long as you then go without delay to a designated port of entry. All those people we see in the news do that because they walk into the chilly embrace of the RCMP, who in fact mm. take them to a designated port of entry. So they are not in breach of immigration law. There's another factor. If you are a refugee claimant and you ultimately succeed in your refugee claim, then any violations of immigration law that you had to commit in order to enter the country will not be held against you. So it is not even if the entry might otherwise be unlawful, if you are found to be a refugee, it's not unlawful for you. The reason that exists is because the drafters of the Refugee Convention and the signatory countries, including Canada and the United States, all recognized that people sometimes have to take desperate measures mm -hmm. to reach safety. And so refugees are not prosecuted for unlawful entry. Let's continue to follow the path. If they, again, refugees, would be refugees, come not at an official port, but rather where that sign is, for example, and they cross the border into Canada, what happens to them then? 
Um, well, they they are detained <coughs> officially by our, our, our CMP, and then they are transferred to the IRCC, the immigration section, and they make a claim. The vast majority of people, or uh, you know, 100 uh, percent, they make a refugee application, and after that, uh, is called an inland refugee application. Inland. Inland okay. and. Originally, they were, uh, these people were transferred to Montreal, no? Everybody was going to Montreal. Now, uh, even though they are transferred to Montreal, the majority of them, because um, the majority are English-speaking people, they are seeing Ontario as an alternative to settle, and they are coming to the city of Toronto. And where do they stay? Uh, they are staying in, uh, in shelters, the, the city, uh, the, has, uh, the city of Toronto has one of the best uh, elaborated uh, networks of uh, emergency shelters for families, singles, women, etc. And that now is over capacity. And they will have to use emergency funds uh, to put these families in hotels, for instance. And they also are opening other facilities, uh, like the, the colleges now, that are closed in the residential for students, mm -hmm. they are opening that one to the influx of people coming through Quebec mostly. But we have another influx of people that have been increasing that is through the airport. And here in Toronto, making refugee applications is inland than they haven't crossed the border through, through Quebec uh, to Canada. And so the number of people, of refugee claimants, is going up in every area that you can see. And presumably that's just a short-term solution, right? Well, how long do people normally stay in those settings? Um, they, they have housing workers, and the people is held to find a permanent place to stay. But remember that our rate of vacancy in the city mm -hmm. of Toronto mm -hmm. is not that high. Pretty tight, yes. And um, there is a very expensive as well. So and the money that the people receive from social services is not enough to find a, an accommodation. So the, the time that the people are staying in shelters or hotels or in colleges is going up. But I agree with you. It's an emergency solution. Mm -hmm. And the refugee houses of the city of Toronto we are working very closely with the, um, you know, the office that is a new commerce office of the city of Toronto to try to make or to build a capacity building plan mm -hmm. for dealing with the influx of refugee claimants well, to the city of Toronto. Let's find out why the influx is as high as it apparently has been over the last <clears throat> six months. How come? Um, I think that it's extremely complicated and when the press focuses on very specific kind of uh, uh, mechanisms and catalysts for it, we can get quite fixated on those. And when we, when we look at irregular migration routes, we, we want to know what the catalysts for change are. And the way that you look at that is, again, like I said, push and pull factors. The one thing that we need to look at as well is, is uh, policy change in, in countries where they're currently residing. So we could look at policy change in the U.S. Such as? Um, such as announcements in the U.S. to, to repeal temporary protected status for people, um, which we know has not been the, the, definitely the main reason for this, this influx of people from a variety of different countries. Um, but it could become a, a, major, a major political uh, uh, situation in the coming year. Um, and this is something that maybe it's not time to talk about it yet, the kind of forecasting around this. Yeah, hold off on that for a second. Yeah. You wanted to add, Audrey? Yes. The premise of the Canada-US Safe Third Country Agreement is that both countries are safe places for people to seek and obtain refugee protection. For several years, then, you haven't seen a lot of people trying to get from the United States into Canada through irregular means. So what has changed? Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you an example. Um, Let's say you have a woman from Honduras. Honduras is a country with the highest rate of femicide, homicide of women in the world. If that woman escapes Honduras, where she is being beaten by her husband, where she cannot get the police to pay any attention to her because the lives of women don't count very much, and she actually makes it to Canada with her children, and she presents her refugee claim to the Immigration and Refugee Claim, and her claim is found to be factually 
um, credible, she will be accepted as a refugee with her children. In Canada? In Canada. Oh, if wow. that same woman goes to the United States and makes a refugee claim there, she will first be arrested. And that's whether she enters irregularly or sometimes even lawfully. Her children will be taken away from her. She will that's be put new. in detention. You should say that. That's her, new. The yes. taking away of children from their parents yes. is new. Is new. It's unprecedented. Um, there's really no obvious justification for it. It's not required. Um, and all evidence seems to indicate that it is done for the express purpose of deterring people from seeking asylum by doing one of the worst things that you can do to inflict suffering on families, which is take children away from parents. When did that policy change? About a month ago. Well, okay. it has been building for several months. Mm -hmm. It has now been made a kind of automatic um, default policy in the last month or two. Do you know if that came from the Department of Justice or the Oval Office, or what, why did that happen? It happened in order to deter people from making claims for refugee protection as well as irregular uh, migration. Is it Let working? Me, uh, not as far as I know. What it is doing is inflicting horrendous suffering on people. And, and, and that is its very purpose. And mm -hmm. so you can imagine, you could decide to deter people by putting snipers at the border. You could decide to deter people uh, through uh, a variety of means. They've decided to deter people through taking children away from their parents. It's designed to inflict suffering. And let me give you another example. Uh, you know, the, the North Triangle of Central America <clears throat> is suffering uh, with gang violence, you know? It's, it's so violent, these uh, Guatemala, Honduras, <clears throat> El Salvador there. So, and the American administration also removed from a, um, a reason to make an asylum claim in the United States gangs violence. Hmm. So what is going to happen is that the people that were going to the United States to make a claim, you know, from El Salvador, from all of these countries, or from other countries that suffer violence, they won't be able to make a claim under that reasons. Mm -hmm. And we continue in our system, because it's one of the best definitions that we have universally as a protection, refugees, and different things, and risk, for instance, uh, they are going to come to Canada because that's the only option that they have. Well, do they come to Canada because, I don't know, Craig, maybe you could help us on this, because the chances of being accepted and given asylum are better than in the United States? I think that but the, the acceptance rate right now is about half for is, is that correct? Yeah. The acceptance rate fluctuates. Right now, it's better in Canada. It wasn't always the case under the yes. previous government. There are really two reasons why they try to come. Well, one, one reason is that they might think they have a better chance of being accepted as refugees in Canada. They might also have family here. That's but the fact is that most of them can't reach Canada and won't be able to reach Canada exactly. in any event because of the various mechanisms that Canada uses to deter them and our geographic isolation. Do we suspect, though, Craig, that, that many of them think they're more likely to get favorable treatment in Canada because the Prime Minister said not too long ago, come on in. So we, we know that public pronouncements about favorable immigration and refugee systems can act as a draw for people. It, it's 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 uh, fraught to make the claim that uh, because we are welcoming, then we'll be overrun by asylum seekers. We shouldn't believe that. It turned out not to be the case in Europe when Angela Merkel made a claim that uh, Germany's doors would be open. Um, and as Audrey mentioned, it's very difficult for people to arrive here just logistically because of geography. The well, thing wait a minute. You say, that you say in Germany they weren't overrun? No, I'm saying, I'm saying that Angela Merkel saying uh, the, her, we will manage her, her famous uh, Verschaffen das mm -hmm. to say that we'll manage this migration crisis. Uh, the right and specific pundits kind of latched onto that to say you caused this migration crisis by telling people that we'd be welcome. I see. The, the, the data shows us that that's not the case. The flow is already increasing. The thing that I worry about is Given policy changes in the U.S. and how difficult it will be, given militarized raids on undocumented people, given family separations, that uh, an irregular migration system might emerge where smugglers stand to make significant profits by bringing people through the U.S. into Canada. Um, and that's something that we should be concerned about. And, and the Safe Third Country Agreement currently 
also incentivizes um, what we call facilitators, so smugglers, to give people information or actively transport them to borders because they know they can't go to a regular port of entry. Audrey? If people, uh, before the Safe Third Country Agreement arrived, people would just show up at a regular port of entry and make an asylum claim. That was the process in existence yes. until 2004. The easiest way to deal with irregular border crossings is simply to do what the agreement permits, which is suspend the agreement. When the circumstances that justify the agreement, namely that both countries are safe for asylum seekers, no longer exist. So that's the important point here. Is, Canada, is the United States a safe place for people to seek refugee protection? In the example I gave you, that Honduran woman would be rejected as a refugee claimant because of the announcement Jeff Sessions, Attorney General of the United States, made recently that will block uh, women experiencing gender-related persecution from refugee protection in the United States. Okay, so you mentioned Jeff Sessions. Let's just do a quote on here, because on Monday of this week, he did release a ruling regarding some groups of asylum seekers attempting to enter the United States. Sheldon, let's put this up here. Here was the statement. Generally, claims by aliens pertaining to domestic violence or gang violence perpetrated by non-government actors will not qualify for asylum. The mere fact that a country may have problems effectively policing certain crimes, such as domestic violence or gang violence, or that certain populations are more likely to be victims of crime, cannot itself establish an asylum claim. I, I hear a lot of exhaling at the table right now. You're, you're... Go ahead, react to that so if you want. So that's a reversal of existing refugee law, not so, just in Canada or the United States, but in a variety of countries. Exactly. So the idea is indeed that being an ordinary victim of ordinary crime may not lead to one getting refugee protection. Mm -hmm. But when the violence by private actors is for a reason related to a convention refugee ground, like gender, when the state does not protect people because of their identity, namely as women or religious minorities or so on, those are the things that take it over the line from ordinary crime and ordinary flaws in criminal prosecutions and protections into the realm of refugee protection. Craig. And, and different regional organizations in, uh, in South America and mm -hmm. Africa have clauses in, in, their, in their regional law about gen things like generalized violence. Um, and, and from an international politics perspective, I mean, Canada has been a leader on this as well. When, when the state can't protect its citizens um, and those citizens have to flee as a result of that lack of protection, we recognize that as a, as a unique set of circumstances. It's, it's, not, it's not as if, um, I mean, what are, the, what are the rates of the, the highest homicide rates? The World Health Organization put out a report it counts for 20% of homicide, global homicides or something? What was the stat? Do you remember this? Well, the, the highest, uh, the risky country on Earth is Honduras, for yeah. instance, and it's due to uh, gang violence. And the femicides did not happen. In El Salvador, it's the same in Guatemala. So and you can go on and on and on from all these are very impoverished countries yeah. that they are dealing with all these social issues and the the state doesn't have any resources whatsoever to deal with the situation. Right. And the way that they are dealing is so wrong because they are saying more police, more detention. But if you go to the, the, um, the prisons in El Salvador, for instance, they are a thousand percent overcrowded. Hmm. Well, you mentioned resources. Let me pick up on that, Francisco. And Sheldon, let's go to the bottom of page three here and put this chart up if we can. The federal government has allocated money we're going to show you the, the money for three provinces in particular right now. It's $50 million in total, $36 million to Quebec. We established earlier that a lot of people go first to Quebec. $11 million to the province of Ontario, $3 million to Manitoba. Francisco, there obviously is going to be a new Ontario government sworn in on the 29th of June. With that $11 million, what do you think job one should be? Um, <clears throat> the priority has to be welcoming refugee claimants. You know, that's the proposal that the civil society have made here in the city of Toronto. It's not closing the doors, it's welcoming. We are proposing to do a welcome center for refugee claimants and newcomers. And why? Because we need to be very proactive in the way that 
the people are going to be, um, you know, integrated in our society and to avoid unfair situations, uh, you know, to be linked to the Board of Education because there are many children here, you know, children needed public health, uh, you know, in terms of vaccinations and everything has to be a, a place that is going to start doing this assessment and starting to distribute it. So you want to build, you want a, a, like an actual location? Where yeah, we already can... made the proposal to the city of Toronto and they got it. They said, yes, you're right, we have to do it. And this is the refugee houses of the city of Toronto being proactive. The other thing that we are doing is, if you are going to start trying to move people to other cities of Ontario, you have to build capacity in the other cities of Ontario. Mm -hmm. Well, you let know? me find out from Craig. What can $11 million do? I think that when we saw that in 2015 and 2016, when, when uh, the federal Liberal government basically won an election by promising to bring more refugees in, that was... We knew they were coming. It was, it was well planned. Uh, <laughs> and still, the city of Toronto in particular was very under capacity. The, the thing that I think that we need to realize is that um, people like Francisco who work in, in the settlement sector, th there's such a depth of knowledge and experience in the city of Toronto dealing with newcomers, asylum seekers, refugees, um, that, you know, top-down government policies, I think, are, are likely not the answer, and they should listen to the real experts, the people who are working on the ground. It doesn't seem to me like $11 million goes very far, um, but if we don't use it as a stopgap measure and instead use it to actually build build permanent capacity on the ground, I think that's that's the right move, in my opinion. Audrey, let me follow up with you in as much as, given the way the United States has changed the way it is approaching this issue, how do you expect, over the course of the rest of the year, the impact of that change will be felt here in Canada? Well... There have been fluctuations in the number of arrivals, and I expect that that will continue. The idea that it is just a solid line always increasing simply doesn't actually isn't borne out by the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, so one might expect continuing fluctuation. I should say that I think I understand that some Ontarians or Canadians feel some anxiety because, because any time numbers increase over the status quo, it seems like an occasion for alarm. But I think perspective is called for here. Canada receives a trivial number of asylum seekers compared to other countries of the world. And yes, the numbers are increasing, and so that requires an allocation of resources. And that, I understand, is a cause for concern. But put in a wider landscape of comparison to other countries, this is really not a crisis. Well, trivial it's means what? Uh, well, uh, the number of asylum seekers who arrived in Canada over the last year irregularly would have arrived in less than a month in Greece. Right? These, it is, you know, perspective is important here. We, so a few one, thousand people we're talking? Yeah, a f one in five people in Lebanon right now is Syrian. Right? Hmm. So That's a crisis. Yeah, so it is true that numbers have increased, but it's important to keep that in perspective and understand that even though Canada has benefited from being next to the United States and isolated from crisis spots in the world, no country um, is immune from the effects of disruption, disorder, chaos, bad governance in other countries. And migration is one mm -hmm. of those effects. And in a sense, what we see across the border from the United States is the effect of governance in the United States now. Yeah. And we have international commitments. You know, we, we are signators of the different conventions that protect and we have to open our society, and our society have proved that it's a very humanitarian oriented. When there is a, a need, we respond. The Syrian crisis is, is, is an example of that. Uh, who reduced the number of Syrians coming to this country was the government, not the civil society. Yeah. The civil society was ready. And the civil society is the one that we have to turn now and say, Listen, we have this number of people coming, we don't know for how long, and they start talking to the faith communities, to people that have empty spaces in their houses, and we are moving in that direction because the society is the one that is going to integrate these people, it's the schools, it's the neighborhoods, it's the, the people working on in many other things, you know what I mean, learning English, I that's got, what we have I to do. I've got about 30 seconds left here for you to tell me how much goodwill do you think there still is in the community 
in the province of Ontario to welcome refugees and integrate them into our society? I think we have two, two societies. Uh, one is a society that doesn't have experience dealing with refugee claimants. And we have a society that is very uh, used to this. Mm. And the people that is used to deal with refugee claimants, they are so open. You know, in our neighborhood, we receive donations in our front door mm -hmm. every single day. People come and ask, what else do you need? People volunteer. So in my opinion, when the people start getting used to this situation and they see that the other human mean is a, is a nice person to welcome, so they open their houses, their doors, you know what I mean? And we welcome everybody. Understood. So I, I don't see a problem with the increase. Can we say gracias to Francisco Rico Martinez from the FCJ Refugee Center? And on the other side of the table, Audrey Macklin, Professor and Chair in Human Rights Law, University of Toronto, Craig Damien Smith, Associate Director, Global Migration Lab, Monk School of Global Affairs at U of T as well. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank Thanks for having us. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.